Good evening and welcome to NASA's Asteroid Initiative Idea Synthesis Workshop. We're broadcasting live on NASA TV from the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, Texas. Over the next couple of days, we'll be talking about the 96 ideas that were selected from more, more than 400 responses to NASA's Asteroid Initiative re request for information released back in June. For those of you tuning in online, we actually have um, um, chat rooms set up and uh, the workshop hashtag is NASA Asteroid and um, we'll have hashtags for each topic session. Um, we ask that you actively participate and keep the conversation going. All the virtual participation options are available at nasa.gov slash asteroid workshop. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Mackwell. He's the director of the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to um, welcome everybody back. It's only been, what, 51 days for many of you, um, for those of you who are here. It, just before October began, uh, welcome back. Uh, we put on some rather cooler weather for you, which um, is nice. It's, pretty time of year in Houston. The, um, the meeting that, that we started 50 days ago was, um, was a very interesting, exciting meeting. I think it was, uh, it was great um, turnout of people, great flux of ideas. It was um, a great beginning to this meeting. And I think um, you know we really do have a, a, the stage set for a very exciting couple of days here. And I'm looking forward to hearing the presentations and seeing what we can do here in the next couple of days. But it's um, obviously it's a very important and vibrant topic and one with a lot of opportunities going forward. So welcome again. Um, I would suggest that, um, that tomorrow at the end of the sessions, I guess the session kind of ends up sometime around 5.30 or something like that tomorrow, or well, the two sessions are gonna end up around then. Tomorrow evening, and this is purely coincidence, we didn't do this, but tomorrow evening, um, David Kring, one of the scientists here at the LPI, is giving a presentation at um, 7.30. It's a public presentation on the 2003 Chelyabinsk airburst and the hazards of near-Earth asteroid impacts. And that's going to be on in this room tomorrow evening at 7.30. It's a public, public uh, kind of presentation, so the, the level is going to be pitched fairly broadly. Um, David is a good speaker, so, um, so it should be pretty good. And afterwards, there'll be refreshments out in the great room here. So everybody, of course, is welcome to disappear quickly for dinner and come back for that if you wish, um, discontinuing the theme of asteroids long. One final thing I have to do, and it's a requirement that I do here, is that um, for those of you who've heard it before, um, if a fire alarm goes off, leave, okay? <laughs> we have fire exits at the back. I'll tell you, if the fire alarm goes off, you will know the fire alarm went off. Um, we actually had alarm go off the last time when we started. At, that wasn't the fire alarm. That was the quiet one. The real fire alarm will have you out of the building very quickly. The easiest way to go is out through the doors here and back out through the foyer and out into the parking lot. Um, there are also fire escapes at the back here. Um, the only other thing I have to mention, and you probably all know this already because most of you have been here already, bathrooms down the corridor over there, um, down that hallway you'll find bathrooms. There's also bathrooms, a couple of bathrooms just in the back here. So I know everybody online really needed to know that. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll pass it back. Thank you, thank you Dr. Mackwell. Um, next up, we have Michelle Gates from the Human Exploration and Missions Operation Directorate at NASA headquarters. Michelle is going to uh, give us a brief overview of the workshop ob objectives. Hi, welcome back. It's very unfortunate that we were um, so abruptly cut off the last time we all met. Um, but we're very excited to continue with what was very important to us, as well as many of our stakeholders. And so what I thought I'd do today is just give a couple chart overview of some of the stuff we talked about last time in the plenary session, and then briefly review the objectives of the workshop, as well as the charge to the session chairs for the closing synthesis session on Friday morning. <clears throat> So you'll remember that there are two aspects of the asteroid initiative. One is the Grand Challenge. Jason Kessler and Jen Kustetic, who are here, I believe, 
um, are going to be leading that. I think there's three sessions in this workshop on the Grand Challenge, uh, which includes um, the CERT Next slide, finding all asteroid threats to human populations and knowing what to do about them. So I know Jason and Jen are very much looking forward to getting started in this workshop with finishing up what was important to them in their planning that we started in October. The other aspect of the initiative, as you know, is the asteroid redirect mission. There are elements that are unique to each and there are elements that are common and leveraged uh, for both. So they're really a synergistic whole. <clears throat> you may recall this slide as well, which talks about the near-term strategy for the asteroid redirect mission, which includes leveraging ongoing activities in uh, the science mission directorate, which um, we have called the identify segment of the mission, which includes uh, studies and trades right now, as well as upgrades and observation assets that Lindley Johnson will be talking to you about a little bit later this evening. In the redirect um, mission segment, uh, there is a reference mission that is currently being studied as well as an alternate mission and we're looking forward to your ideas, hearing those in this meeting as well as um, your thoughts and inputs in the uh, synthesis session. The last segment is the redirect crewed mission, which includes um, leveraging the activities that the agency has going on right now, the Orion and SLS vehicles, and how we can use those uh, beyond the moon to accomplish this compelling mission. Steve Stitch is gonna be speaking after me in detail about that and sharing some updates as well. We have evolved our thinking on the mission objectives, and we have listened to the feedback that we have received to date. Um, so I wanted to share with you today, this is actually the first time that I think we've talked broadly about this, but the primary objectives that we're currently planning to and doing analysis against are human exploration in the mid-2020s to an asteroid that prepares for future exploration activities, technology demonstration of advanced solar electric propulsion, and enhanced detection and observation of near-Earth asteroids for planetary defense. Those are the three main areas that we're looking at as the primary objectives of the mission. There are many secondary benefits and objectives, as you have heard previously, and that we have talked about broadly at length, as this initiative is so broad. And that includes asteroid deflection demonstration or proof of concept, which is another aspect of planetary defense. Um, Lindley Johnson, again, is here and going to talk about that. Uh, science benefits, international partnership opportunities, commercial partnership opportunities, excuse me, opportunities, and that includes, for example, in situ resource utilization. There's also some ground rules that we've been taking in our analysis as boundaries, including affordability, manageable risk tolerance in technical risk, and programmatic viability. We currently have three internal mission studies going on. One is the reference robotic mission concept, which again is to redirect a small near-Earth asteroid to a stable orbit in the lunar vicinity and potentially demonstrate asteroid deflection. And the study is being led by the Jet Propulsion Lab, it's NASA-wide, and there's significant involvement and in partnership with the Glenn Research Center in that study. We're also looking at an alternate concept to redirect a small mass from a larger asteroid and potentially demonstrate um, potentially hazardous asteroid size deflection. The study, this study is being led by Lindley Research Center. It also includes many of the same members as the previous study, and so we're looking forward to how both of those turn out, as well as evolve with the ideas in this workshop. The crewed mission is being looked at by the Johnson Space Center, and again, Steve Stich will talk to you more about that when he comes up. This slide is just a brief summary of our current status, which has evolved since the last first day of the workshop that we had previously. Um, we have chartered a robotic concept integration team. That team is being led by Jim Ryder from the Marshall Space Flight Center, who's sitting over there, just raised his hand. He's also the chair of the um, redirect session, <coughs> which was held last time. Uh, consistent with our guidance, our acquisition strategy foundation is to leverage ongoing work, and y'all are well aware of that. We, we do want to pursue partnerships and participatory engagement. This 
workshop is a part of that and we have some internal status briefing scheduled and our planning and industry day for the spring of next year in which we'll, we'll share our status as a result of near-term decisions including this meeting planned updates to FY14 plans as well as communicate our plan in the 15 um, NASA budget we did want to emphasize this time that we believe this activity does advance existing policy goals. There's a list that you can read at your leisure, or we'd be happy to talk about. There are several areas of bipartisan, part of, um, bipartisan policy that this initiative is responsive to. Chris Moore will talk to you more this evening about um, a summary of the RFI results, as well as um, the review process. And here's the core, why we're here at this meeting, is to hear what you have to say. We want to examine and foster a broad discussion on the ideas coming forth in this meeting, as well as discuss, debate, and synthesize a set of findings that we can take back and use within NASA. Um, our NASA personnel will serve as leads in our discussions, but we ask for your active participation. You'll see in the workshop sessions the seating, the seating is auditorium styled but that is just due to space limitation. Please have open discussion. Please feel free to speak up. We have already read the RFIs. We really want to hear what you have to say and what you think, including the folks online. There's chat rooms, there's Twitter. We've got facilitators and moderators who are available in the sessions to help with that. And so Friday morning, we'll be hearing a synthesis results of each session presented to us by the session chairs. They've been given a request for specific areas to bring out of the session discussions and present to us. This is a summary chart here, but Chris Moore is actually going to talk to you a little bit more about this when he gets up. That's all I have. Thank you, Michelle. Um, next, we're going to hear from Steve Stitch. He's the Deputy Director at Johnson Space Center here in Houston. And as Michelle stated, he's um, going to talk about the Asteroid Redirect Mission with a focus on current activities related to the crew portion. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. Before I get started, I'd like to thank Dr. Maxwell and the Lunar Planetary Institute for, uh, for hosting us again here. I think uh, they have treated us very well. We're not like uh, in-laws or something that won't leave. but. But uh, th thanks very much for hosting us again. And also on behalf of the Johnson Space Center, uh, Ellen Ochoa and Kirk Shireman, the Center Director and Deputy Center Director, I'd like to welcome everybody here to the, uh, the Asteroid Workshop. I'm gonna try to talk a little bit tonight uh, about what we've been doing relative to the mission and also sort of frame it in the context of the capability-driven framework and how what we're doing with this first exploration mission uh, as one mission in a series of missions, we're trying to take capabilities that we're building Across, uh, across NASA, across uh, HEOMD, across the Space Technology Mission Director, and pull those together into a single mission. If you look at this image, this is a pretty bold uh, mission. If you think about this time frame in the, in the early 2020s, some 50 years after we would have flown the Apollo missions, we will send two crew members uh, further into deep space than they've ever traveled before to uh, obtain some samples from an asteroid that we've moved there using a robotic spacecraft. So it's a very ambitious mission. As a former shuttle flight director, I think about this mission, and I think, wow, it'd be great to be on console for this mission. So within HEO, we're really operating on six principles in terms of putting together our uh, exploration plan. We need to execute our missions uh, within a sustainable budget. Uh, we realize uh, the situation relative to the budget, and so we have to keep that in mind as we build our missions. We're trying to take high TRL, high, uh, uh, very mature technologies that are ready to be infused into a mission and bring those together uh, into a compelling mission. We're also looking for near-term opportunities uh, to, to fly in space, to push forward in deep space uh, relative to, to eventual goal of sending humans to Mars in the 2030s. And then we also look for opportunities to, uh, to bring our commercial uh, partnerships along and commercial business to further enhance that industry as well. We've had uh, great partnerships uh, on the International Space Station with commercial cargo, and so we see this as another avenue that's very important as we build our strategy. And then we're looking to put together uh, infrastructure in space that's, that's used for a long time. It can't be kind of a single purpose mission, but it needs to kind of feed forward uh, to deep space exploration. And then again, we want to work strongly with our international partners, 
and leverage the partnerships that we have on the International Space Station today and also our commercial partnerships as we move forward. So our overall purpose is to move, to move forward from the left part of the slide where today uh, in the shuttle program and then in the International Space Station program, we've been operating uh, very well and doing a lot of great research and exploration on the International Space Station, but we're very much in a, what we would call an Earth-reliant centric model where we're very dependent on uh, resupply from the Earth. We need to move to that final destination, which is Mars on the right-hand portion of the slide, which is Earth independent, where we need to be much more on our own in terms of uh, not having that supply chain from the Earth. And the, the way we're going to do this is we're going to move into this proving ground, which in the middle of the slide you can see the moon and, and cislunar space. And you can see the slide that shows the Orion Dock 2, uh, the asteroid redirect vehicle, and, and how we would move into that area to be begin to buy down the risk. If you think about today on the International Space Station, uh, the crew is a mere one or two days from returning to Earth. Um, and in fact, if there were an emergency, they can be back to the Earth within hours. As we move into cislunar space, those transit times are on the order of, depending on the time chosen, somewhere on the order of six to 12 days to return back to the Earth. And if you think about Mars, those transit times are on the order of six to nine months. So we're kind of moving out, you know, if you look at it in terms of a, a sailing ship, we're moving into that deep waters much more slowly as we evolve our capability to Mars. It all starts uh, with the International Space Station. Of course, today is the uh, 15th anniversary of the first element launch, which was Zarya. If you think about where we started 15 years ago, it was incredible. We only had uh, 44,000 pounds of hardware in space. Today, we have an International Space Station that's, uh, that's a little less than, than a million pounds of hardware. And today, the things we're doing on Space Station feed directly toward exploration. Uh, we're testing human health and performance. Uh, we're embarking on longer and longer crew durations. We're trying to understand how the human body performs in space in terms of uh, cardiac performance, uh, bone loss, how to sustain the human body in space. Eventually in uh, 2015, we'll fly a one-year duration, which is kind of building up with two crew members, uh, building up toward Mars. We're also using the space station as a habitability and logistics test bed of how we would work those kinds of things for, uh, for moving on to, to Mars. And then it's a technology test bed where we're testing things like a docking technology, how do we do closed loop life support better to sustain a crew all the way to Mars? Those systems are in their infancy and they're working well on the space station and we need to use those systems, uh, improve those systems on the space station to build forward. Uh, also, we can look at how well hardware performs in space for long durations. Uh, the Zarya element and the node uh, have been in space for 15 years and so we can understand the performance of those systems as well. And then of course, uh, Today, we're in the process of turning LEO over to a commercial endeavors through commercial cargo and commercial crew programs. In, in fact, this week on Tuesday, we released the uh, request for proposals for the commercial crew, next phase of the contract, so we're moving, moving out in that direction as well. Now, our programs today in exploration are not just about paper designs, not just about analysis and documentation, but we're really moving into a phase where you can see our hardware beginning to take shape. You can see the next launch vehicle beginning to take shape and the Orion spacecraft as well. In this slide, if you look at the upper left, you can see we've had uh, already three successful ground tests of the uh, space launch system development motors. These are derivatives of the shuttle motors. So again, we're taking capabilities we've had in the past and building them up into the space launch system. We've got on the upper right hand, you've got the core stage computers being installed and ready for testing uh, very soon. Uh, on the uh, uh, test bed, the, the, the flight test bed uh, in, in the Marshall Space Flight Center. At the Machute Assembly Facility in the bottom left, we're doing friction stir welds. Uh, on the barrel section, uh, the tank is derived from shuttle technology, but we're using modern manufacturing. And then we're about to get very soon back into RS-25, which is a derivative of the shuttle main engine testing on the test stands at Stennis Space Center. Uh, the inlet conditions are slightly different for, uh, for the SLS rocket. So the space launch system is going to be a very versatile uh, launch vehicle. It really is the key to enabling missions in deep space. It will lift up to 25 metric tons uh, to the cislunar environment, to the DRO environment, which I'll talk about a little longer, and then it's up to 70 metric tons to low Earth orbit with initial capability, which is evolvable to up to 130 metric tons. When we turn to the crew vehicle, Orion is beginning to take shape as well, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about how Orion will be very uh, beneficial uh, for this asteroid redirect mission. 
Uh, we had a very, very big milestone recently at the Kennedy Space Center uh, where we've done power on testing uh, in the upper left hand corner. Uh, of the slide for, uh, for the Orion uh, Exploration Flight Test 1 configuration. We're bringing those systems online, we're powering them up, exchanging data and letting the computers com send commands out to the various uh, propulsion elements and various other pieces of the vehicle, so it's a very important milestone. We've done uh, nine parachute drop tests for Orion to date, and we've done a variety of configurations uh, with, here you see the, the three chute cluster, We've done one parachute out. We've uh, done a single drogue chute. We've done a variety of tests to stress the envelope of this system. And uh, so far, the performance has been very well. We've been sharing this data with, uh, with our commercial uh, crew partners. They're using some of the same technology. So again, we're making great progress there. Uh, on the upper right, you, we've done uh, water landing tests with the vehicle to understand how it performs and floats uh, in a water environment. At the bottom left, you can see the, uh, the heat shield, which is up at Textron. Uh, near Boston, and it's, uh, it's finalizing its uh, preparation for being shipped to the Kennedy Space Center uh, later this month. Uh, we've put together the back shell for the Exploration Flight Test 1 unit in the bottom, uh, on the bottom row in the middle slide, and uh, that's uh, progressing well. And then recently, uh, out, at, uh, out at Sunnyvale, uh, we've done the fairing SEP test. These fairings are on the service module and actually help carry the load. Those separate uh, during powered flight very important for those to perform well, and we've completed that test. This is all moving toward Exploration Flight Test 1 uh, in 2014. So this is real hardware coming together, which would be the first test of the Orion heat shield in the actual environment. We'll get up to, uh, to about uh, 60 to 70% of the cislunar uh, speed required for entry. Uh, it does two revs around the Earth. We'll also get a little test of the uh, uh, on the Delta IV Heavy, the, the upper stage is very, has a lot of common components to what we're going to use for future exploration missions, so we'll get a great test of that. The hardware is coming together and uh, the vehicle will be readied in the springtime. So the, this is a real mission, real hardware moving forward uh, in exploration. This leads us to uh, EM-1 in the 2017 timeframe. And this is the first integrated test of the, uh, of the space launch system with the Orion vehicle. We've recently changed the mission. We've baselined this distant retrograde orbit, which you can see on the right-hand part of the slide. Um, that's the kind of orbit we're going to need for this asteroid redirect mission. And so we see uh, this test flight uncrewed uh, using uh, the trajectory, simulating the trajectory in the distant retrograde orbit is very beneficial. We can learn uh, how to target all the burns, the navigation required for each of the burns. It'll be a, a good dry run from a mission perspective uh, for the asteroid redirect mission. So this is a recent change and a, a very important. Now as we move into the asteroid redirect mission, um, uh, you can see the mission uses the, uh, the SLS uh, and Orion vehicles. So Orion heads out to the distant retrograde orbit, which is a great uh, uh, orbit about the moon that we found that it's, it's called retrograde because it kind of travels in the opposite direction of the, the moon's orbit, but it's a very balanced uh, place to be. It's a good place for us to bring the asteroid to, and also we can get there with Orion. We'll uh, dock to, uh, to the robotic spacecraft with Orion, and then we'll perform uh, two EVAs, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. And then, of course, the, the main objective is to get, get a sample from the asteroid and then bring that back uh, in Orion. So uh, this will try to build upon some of the capabilities we have in development. So I've talked about the space launch system, I've talked about Orion. What we're doing with the rendezvous and trajectory work is we're building upon capabilities that we've had on previous programs. Uh, here you can see on the right hand part of the slide uh, what the trajectory looks like. It takes about nine days to get out for this particular launch, launch date to the distant retrograde orbit where the uh, asteroid ro robotic spacecraft will be. We use a, a lunar gravity assist on the, on the way out, which we've uh, taken that trick from many of our scientific missions that have used that, um, and it slingshots us into this distant retrograde orbit. We'll spend about five days there doing a couple spacewalks, and then we'll return. The return flight time for this particular launch date is about 11 days, and again, we'll use a flyby of the moon on the way back. It'll be a spectacular view of the moon flying by at about um, 100 kilometers. On the left-hand side, you can see we're trying to leverage a lot of the work that we've done uh, from the space shuttle program. Toward the very end of the shuttle program, we flew a variety of sensors on board the shuttle in parallel with the system we used to, to do the approach to station, to test their performance. 
we're utilizing some of those sensor systems for, uh, for both the robotic vehicle. We're looking at the commonality between that sensor system for the robotic vehicle and Orion. So we're leveraging that technology. There's a lot of synergy between those two. And then we're continuing to work and refine how that system performs uh, relative to the trajectory, and we've done testing with those sensors. So this builds on real sensors that have flown in space before. In terms of the docking system, so this is another thing. If you think about the rendezvous sensors and trajectory, that feeds forward to exploration. All the destinations are going to require uh, an approach to another uh, object in space. The docking system is the same way. We're leveraging a lot of the work that we're doing today on the International Space Station. It's kind of a two-phased approach where we're using uh, this international docking system standard on the International Space Station. That's completed a, a PDR recently in the September preliminary design review. In the September time frame, they're working toward a critical design review uh, next summer and then the delivery of hardware in the 2015-2016 time frame. That, you can see on the upper right, there's a couple of locations uh, that are going to be utilized on the International Space Station uh, to allow the commercial crew vehicles to dock. We're taking that same hardware and we're feeding that forward to the asteroid redirect mission. On the left-hand side, you can see the active docking mechanism extended. That'll go on the Orion spacecraft. Uh, in kind of in the center of the slide, there's the passive mechanism that goes on the robotic spacecraft. So it's a phase two approach for uh, the docking system. So we're feeding that forward to space station. If you look uh, at the way we're going to transport this to the International Space Station, we're going to use the Dragon uh, cargo vehicle to bring it up. So we're combining our commercial crew program, International Space Station, and exploration together to put together the docking system, which then feeds forward to the rest of exploration. Now I'll talk a little bit about EVA, whoops, our EVA development. And this is a very important part of the mission, so we have a, a video we'll show. And uh, this shows the crew coming out of the Orion uh, spacecraft. Orion will be serve as the airlock for the asteroid redirect mission based on our concept. They'll use some very simple poles to traverse across to the robotic spacecraft. And uh, it looks very simple in the video and animation. Uh, but we've spent a lot of time already in our neutral buoyancy uh, laboratory here in Houston simulating these very, uh, very techniques. You can see a crew member uh, practicing egress from the Orion hatch in our modified ACES, which is a little bit like a Gemini spacesuit. Um, and now uh, you can see the next phase of the EVA would be to uh, traverse across the spacecraft. Here you can see Rex Walheim, a mission specialist that flew on STS-135, traversing across a set of handrails. Um, that uh, it's actually space station hardware in the neutral buoyancy lab, but he's practicing that same technique to understand the suit performance. You can see a lot of the hardware on the suit is derivative from shuttle and space station, and uh, the suit is a derivative from uh, the shuttle uh, entry suit. And now you can see uh, this again is Rex trying to see what kind of tasks he can work on. Here he is in the neutral buoyancy lab uh, using something called a portable foot restraint and he's installing it in a, a socket, which he would typically do, and these are the kind of tasks we might need to do on the asteroid. So again, we're in the neutral buoyancy lab trying to understand the performance of this suit, and the suit is a, a very important er, early uh, part of the mission. Here you can see one of the next tasks would be to set up the crew member in position to extract the samples, and here you can see a Rex Walheim again in the NBL, managing his tether and practicing traversing across a simulated part of uh, the asteroid. And so we've completed a total of eight tests in the in neutral buoyancy lab uh, already in the suit. And we have uh, about six more planned for next year. Next year, we'll move into a little bit higher fidelity phase. We'll upgrade the suit, uh, try to improve the performance of the suit. Uh, in September, we did two, uh, two four-hour runs to try to uh, prove out the duration that we might need for the mission. Here you can see the crew members uh, doing some photography and then starting to extract the samples. These are notional uh, videos and here you can see uh, Rex uh, in the NBL uh, working, doing some pretty delicate tasks. We've got the, the same gloves on the suit that we use uh, on Space Station today and so we've made that change to the suit. So again, real progress this year, more planned progress next year. And here you can see uh, Rex in the NBL one after another sample and putting it in a bag. And you can see it's tethered just like we would uh, execute in the real asteroid redirect mission. So again, real progress uh, on spacewalking. 
Now we'll talk a little bit about uh, the primary life support system that enables this, uh, this technology. Uh, we have an advanced exploration system project that's looking at an advanced spacesuit life support system. They've been working for several years. La this past uh, fiscal year, they've completed a prototype of that system, and uh, it's in testing uh, here at the Johnson Space Center. We've got, uh, if you look in the upper right, you can see uh, what looks like a crew member next to the, the PLIS, which is in the two brackets on the upper right. We've got this metabolic simulator, and we're into testing already uh, on this PLIS, and this PLIS feeds forward very well. This primary life support system feeds well for both on Mars and, uh, and other missions. And then at the bottom right, you can see the kind of modifications that we need to perform to make the, the modified uh, advanced crew escape suit uh, functional for this mission, helmet lights, backpack cameras, display module. We're already working on the design for where we would put those things, how we would interface them to the suit. So that work is uh, ongoing today. So again, in terms of suit, we're leveraging technology that we're working on today trying to integrate that into the mission and then looking how that feeds forward with exploration. And then the same thing with, uh, with our high-powered solar electric propulsion system that enables the, the asteroid to be brought back to the distant retrograde orbit. Uh, today that system would be on the order of 40 to 50 kilowatts using three 13 kilowatt thrusters. That then feeds forward to, uh, to exploration into the 90 to 100 kilowatt with the same kind of thrusters, and then that evolves to what we would need for cargo delivery to Mars, for example, on the upper right, which is on the order of 250 kilowatts using a, a little bit higher powered thrusters. And in the bottom, you can see that we're currently under our Space Technology Mission Directorate working on solar ray technology. Uh, that's real funded work within, uh, within the agency, and also thrusters and power processing units. So here we're taking a capability that we're working on in the Space Technology Mission Directorate, and infusing that into this asteroid mission, then that feeds forward for exploration. And then finally, how does this mission feed forward to Mars? Um, this chart across the top shows the different kinds of missions, the current mission on ISS, the asteroid redirect mission, and then longer stays in deep space, and we're working our way out to Mars on the upper right. You can see that each of these things that we're doing sort of build in a stair-step fashion to get us further into space and then build capabilities for the next mission. So again, we're trying to slowly work our way into the solar system and use this mission as the start. At the bottom, you can see ISS provides the deep space habitat, life support, and autonomous assembly that we've been working on. That feeds forward to all the different Mars missions. For, uh, for the asteroid mission, we add those pieces of the, spa the space launch system to get heavy lift, which we need to get cargo beyond uh, the Earth's gravi gravity field. We get the Orion high-speed entry capability. We get exploration EVA, and then we get this solar electric propulsion capability, which enables exploration. And then someday, we're, we continue to work on the other pieces at the top to build these stepping stones to Mars. And finally, um, how does this enable exploration? You can see on the right-hand side uh, three different kind of visions of how this feeds forward. The upper right slide shows uh, continued utilization of the asteroid in the distant retrograde orbit with uh, what we call an exploration augmentation module concept. It could be provided by an international partner or commercial or a NASA provided, but it would extend the stay time in the distant retrograde orbit. You can see uh, our, international, our international partners in particular are very interested in lunar missions. And you can see in the middle slide on the right how that then would feed forward to a potential low lunar orbit kind of campaign. And then at the bottom, you can see how this feeds forward to deep space. So again, I won't read through these, but you can see how this builds the systems we need for exploration on this first exploration mission. We get Orion and SLS. We get solar electric propulsion. And then uh, we get deep space capabilities like rendezvous and docking and EVA, which then feed forward. So that's a little bit about what we've, we've been doing uh, here at the Johnson Space Center. We look forward to the session tomorrow at 1.30 to, uh, to get your ideas as well. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Next up, we have Brian Wilcox. He's from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he's going to discuss the latest work in the asteroid redirect mission, um, the ca capture system design and analysis. Good evening. Um, 
For the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about the uh, capture mechanism and process uh, envisioned for the so-called reference mission that uh, Michelle described earlier. And, um, and this, uh, if, uh, if people on the web can see my laser pointer, uh, basically it describes the, uh, the bag going over the asteroid, uh, which you've seen in the animation that was released in the, during the summer. I'm not going to replay that animation. It's a great, uh, it's a great animation uh, done by the Langley Research Center. Um, um, but I'm going to talk about the details of that process. Um, the, uh, the thing about uh, the asteroid capture process and the reason we're focusing on it tonight uh, of all the subsystems on that reference mission is that uh, it's the thing that really hasn't been done and it's the thing that strikes many people as quite sporty. Um, and so, uh, you know, we need to pay attention to uh, the possibilities of what we might confront when we get there. Uh, first thing, we don't know a lot about these asteroids. Uh, many of them are probably rocks, uh, that is, uh, the ones that you know, turn out to be meteorites when they hit the ground uh, because they made it through the atmosphere are the more competent ones. There's lots of reasons, however, to believe that the um, meteors that enter the atmosphere that uh, many of fragments don't make it to the ground is because that they're not very competent. And so they could be uh, in the form of dirt clods and we do see uh, pieces of asteroidal material uh, that do make it to the ground that, that have much the consistency of dirt clods. Uh, and then they're also quite possibly just um, grains of sand that are bonded together by molecular forces that are uh, extremely weak and uh, where the slightest touch would, uh, would break up the, the object. So that led us to focus on the bag uh, because not only did we want to uh, confine the whole asteroid and bring the whole thing back, uh, but we also wanted to protect our solar arrays and our optical surfaces and our radiators uh, from contamination. So uh, all the ideas that you might imagine, you know, harpoons and lassos and side it when considered that aspect of the uh, of the problem that that it could well be one of these rubble piles uh, you know some people have called them sandbars uh, the other uh, aspect of it is the spin state um, certainly many of them do spin very slowly hours uh, you know rotation period um, but some do uh, 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 many of them do tumble, and the smaller they are, the more likely they are to tumble because the t uh, time to relax to a principal axis spin uh, is long compared to the time between collisions, in fact, long compared to the age of the solar system. So for these small objects, we would expect them to, uh, uh, in many cases, be tumbling. Um, and the one that gives us real pause are the ones that are uh, spinning fast and tumbling, the ones that are in excess of 1 RPM. Um, and tumbling, and, and you'll see in a few minutes why that, uh, why that is. Um, the uh, distribution of spin states uh, has been uh, mapped. This, uh, this is maybe a year old. Uh, there, I think there are a few more objects that have been uh, identified. Uh, but, you know, most of the larger objects, here we have absolute magnitude, which is a, basically an astronomer's way of uh, saying how big it is. Uh, and in the box, we have the range of interest to us, which is about 5 to 10 meters in diameter. Um, the bigger objects uh, tend to be clustered just below the so-called spin barrier or rubble pile limit, where the gravity is equal to the centrifugal force at the equator. And that is one of the th things that leads people to believe the fact that there's so many clustered right up to that limit and very few beyond it, that there are many of these objects are very weak. Um, but as you get sm uh, uh, smaller and smaller, that spin barrier no longer appears to uh, be a, uh, a major constraint. And, uh, and you do see objects spinning faster. And at the 1 RPM, you know, you see a few objects have been discovered that are faster than 1 RPM. But many of the most of the population of interest to us uh, is spinning slower than that. So one thing we could do is we could just say, well, we're not going to go after any fast spinners. But, uh, it's incumbent upon uh, the team to evaluate whether indeed, you know, we have to make that constraint because we'd like to, you know, if we find a great, a great target that just happens to be spinning fast, we'd like to be able to go after it. Uh, the current thinking of the uh, bag is to have uh, these pie-shaped wedges that we can inflate interior to the bag and thereby grab the surface of the asteroid if it is spinning rapidly. Uh, we could grab that, uh, that surface quickly and, um, and apply a pressure comparable to the, 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 the yield strength, the uh, tensile strength of the, 
of the asteroid, you know, a fraction of a PSI, and yet over the huge, you know, area, surface areas that we're talking about, uh, t many tens of square meters, uh, we would have um, the, the um, forces that we need to de-spin and de-tumble uh, those objects. So we have an inflatable exoskeleton that deploys the bag, and then uh, we get the asteroid into the bag, and then uh, if it's a fast spinner, we would deploy those bags to quickly capture it. So if it's a slow spinner, we would bring it into the bag, uh, but then just use cinch winches to, to pull the bag closed. So uh, these winches, very much like uh, fishing reel winches that basically have a slip clutch so that if the fish wants to run, it, it can run, because after all, you have a thousand ton object, uh, and if it wants to do something, it's gonna do it. Um, so, so you basically have these slip, uh, these winches with slip clutches that uh, you can gradually close the bag over it as the air is bled out of the system as the gas is vented, um, and you don't need to deploy. You know, if it's a slow spinner, you don't really need to deploy these in interior bags. But if it's a fast spinner, uh, then the feeling is you would uh, deploy these wedge-shaped bags uh, in a very rapid. Uh, time. Uh, in, in vacuum, of course, these bags deploy very rapidly because um, they're not limited by the uh, gas uh, pressure uh, on the front face. And, uh, and so these, uh, we have convinced ourselves that with uh, a sufficient number, we're showing six and we believe that six is probably a good number, uh, as well as in interior shear panels, we can make this as stiff as we need it to make it in order to get the right, the right properties for the uh, for the system. Uh, so here's an animation, a dynamic simulation of it, and we're showing here where the spacecraft is lined up on the angular momentum vector of the asteroid, but it is not a simple spinner, it's a tumbling asteroid. And so the instantaneous spin axis shown in red uh, is kind of wanders around the angular momentum vector that is constant. And so what you see from the spacecraft, you see a continuous rotation. Here, however, we have lined up the spacecraft spin around a future axis that we know the angular, the, the spin velocity will reach. And so when the timer gets to 30 seconds, it will be perfectly lined up spinning. The spacecraft will be spinning at the exact same speed as the, as the asteroid. So with that approach, we're able to um, get zero relative motion at the instant that we grab. And so here again, at, uh, at 30 seconds, uh, the spacecraft motion, the asteroid motion relative to the spacecraft will be zero at the moment of capture. And, uh, and so, um, you know, we're just now coming up on the uh, point where there's no relative motion. We trigger the bags and we capture the object and then we go for a ride. And uh, the spacecraft, as you see, you know, starts to move in a significant way uh, off both uh, in rotation and, and uh, translation. And it, uh, this, is, this is a typical case where it rotates out along the equator, the belt line of the asteroid. And that's a good thing for us because that means the uh, reaction control system thrusters on the end of the spacecraft have a nice long lever arm with which to de-spin and de-tumble this object. Now it only takes a relatively few newtons of force <laughs> Uh, over a period of hours to de-spin uh, de and de-tumble an object even a thousand tons spinning at two RPM or more. Um, but the, uh, the key thing is that you need a long lever arm if you're going to be efficient in your use of uh, a propellant. Now here in the lower corner you see the so-called solar array deployment actuator torque which is the key thing that is going to break on the spacecraft is the joint where the solar wings you know, hang off the spacecraft. And so uh, when you accelerate the spacecraft, if there's too much torque on that deployment actuator, the solar arrays break off, and that's a bad day. So uh, that is the most sensitive part of the spacecraft, and that is the thing about the spacecraft that is, uh, is most in need of protection uh, with our uh, approach to uh, grabbing, uh, grabbing the uh, the, the asteroid. So we have done a uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So we simulated about 5,500 uh, 5, different cases uh, with a wide variety of spin rates and shapes and, and uh, angles between the angular momentum vector and the principal axes. And, um, and of course, it's the, it's the 
uh, flapping motion of the solar array around what we call the y-axis here that is the, the greatest concern because that when you, when you yank on the spacecraft with the thousand ton rock, um, that's the thing, that's the mode that it's going to uh, see the largest uh, torque. So uh, as you see here, we've plotted the, um, the torque about all three axes, but the, it's the torque around that, that y-axis that is in every case the, the largest. And as we go out to 2 RPM, uh, we see that uh, we uh, have um, a reasonable amount because the vendors for the solar array deployment actuators have told us that with essentially no uh, special effort, they can achieve 1,765 newton meters of, of torque um, as their design limit. And so you see here that even in the case of 2 RPM, we're below that. And here we have tuned the stiffness of the bags, the pressure in the bags, and the, and the uh, number of shear panels and so on in order to make the bag have the right elastic properties, the spring, dampering, spring and damping properties. Uh, so that it uh, achieves this performance. And uh, working with our inflatable people, uh, you know, that have done the airbags on Pathfinder and MER and, and the, uh, the new low density decelerator, um, that uh, those people tell us they can achieve these levels of stiffness and, and damping in the, uh, uh, in the inflatable system. Uh, we have built a test bed, and that test bed allows us, it's a one-fifth scale, so we have a two-meter asteroid, which is actually a piece of styrofoam covered in rhino bed liner, which is what you spray the back of your truck, your pickup truck with to protect it. Um, but it looks quite like, much like an asteroid, and we have a bag, uh, and we have, uh, it's lined with Vectrans, uh, which is a fabric that we got actually left over from the last uh, airbag uh, system, which was the Mars Exploration Rovers. Um, they had a, a whole bunch of fabric left over, so we managed to get that from them. Uh, and then we got an inflatable structure from a company that makes bounce houses for uh, children's birthday parties. And they said, sure, we'll build you that, and no problem. Uh, so we built this inflatable exoskeleton, and then we put the, uh, the, the rock on the end of an eight degree of freedom robot arm that has a force torque sensor at the point of attachment uh, between the last uh, degree of freedom and the, uh, and the rock. So that when the bag closes over it, basically it has this little uh, uh, spike that goes up into the center of the asteroid and then there's a spin axis so that we can spin it continuously about one axis and then we can move it in a cyclic way about all the other axes and thereby simulate tumbling motion. Uh, we measure the forces and torques on that spike at the point of attachment and thereby measure the forces that are applied by the bag to the asteroid after accounting for the, gra you know, the gravitational forces on the asteroid. And so that allows us to, to, uh, to, to evolve the spin physics in a realistic way so that we can um, basically just apply, you know, Newton's law that says the time rate of change of angular momentum is the applied torque. We measure the applied torque. We, we know what the angular momentum of the asteroid is, so we can say what the future, you know, what the next spin state is in every instant of time. Um, and this will allow us to answer questions that you could never get out of a computer simulation, like does the fabric snag on the rock? Excuse me. Um, so we're going to put little Matterhorn rocks on the surface of our asteroid and see if we can get the, get the fabric to snag and what does that do when one side of the rock snags on it and, and, and uh, you know, the other side is slipping. Um, we can answer questions like do the cinch cord, cords of the cinch winches, do they slide freely over the surface of the bag or does the bag bunch up in one spot and limit the motion of the cinch cords so that the cinch cords don't uh, completely uh, close the whole bag, but they get bound up and, and uh, the bag stops closing prematurely. Those kinds of questions you could never answer uh, with, any, to, with any confidence in a computer simulation. Um, and so with that, I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, next up we have Lindley Johnson. He's the Near Earth Objects Program Executive in Planetary Science Division at NASA Headquarters. He'll share with us a little bit about NASA's observation campaign. 
Oh, thank you very much. It's nice to be here this time. I wasn't able to join you in the first uh, part of this workshop, so it's nice of uh, everybody to have delayed this for me to be able to join you <laughs> for the continuation. Uh, so, um, talk to you tonight about uh, our near Earth object observation program and uh, how we are going to use that program and enhancements to it to be able to find the uh, right candidate uh, uh, for this uh, redirect mission. Uh, you've heard about the Grand Challenge uh, already. Uh, we actually started working this Grand Challenge uh, about a year ago, even though it wasn't announced until uh, uh, June of, of last year. Uh, but um, uh, the reason why uh, it's uh, very important to all of us uh, Earth residents uh, was uh, made evident to us almost on cue uh, in February of this year with the uh, Selyabinsk event uh, in Russia. Uh, where uh, a relatively small asteroid, only uh, uh, latest uh, analysis showed it to be about 19 meters in size, uh, exploded, entered the atmosphere and exploded uh, over the city of Chelyabinsk, uh, detonating with uh, energy of uh, uh, something over 500 uh, kilotons of TNT. Uh, so uh, object that small uh, releasing that, uh, that much energy is um, uh, quite a... Uh, uh, site and uh, it was captured uh, of course this is probably going to be the best studied uh, asteroid entry uh, uh, ever uh, the uh, meter uh, meter and uh, uh, asteroid scientists have gotten spoiled by all the data they got from the uh, dash cams of the Russians uh, but uh, but it did uh, 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 cause a significant emergency uh, for the Russian population there in Sagabinsk and over um, 1,600 citizens uh, being injured by the broken glass that was caused by the uh, blast wave uh, from this object, uh, even though it detonated uh, uh, some 20 uh, uh, kilometers uh, up in the atmosphere. Uh, the uh, shock wave hit the town uh, a few minutes later while everybody was looking out the window staring at this uh, uh, contrail that had been uh, uh, displayed across the sky and did some $30 million of damage. Few broken windows, but if you think of uh, the temperatures in uh, Western Siberia in uh, February, uh, uh, it was a bit of an emergency on their part to get uh, the windows fixed uh, to, to be able to keep their buildings heated. So even though it was a fairly small event as uh, planetary impacts go, uh, it uh, still uh, uh, caught everybody's uh, attention. Um, so the grand challenge has uh, uh, Michelle described earlier is uh, one part of the agency's overall asteroid initiative, the other part being the asteroid redirect uh, mission. And um, uh, what uh, has been described here uh, uh, this evening, it's kind of interesting, we began with a vision of what we want to get to and now we're showing you how we're going to get there. Um, but the uh, Near Earth Object Observation Program uh, sits right in the middle of both these, uh, 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 both these uh, endeavors. And uh, we need to enhance the capabilities that we currently have with the observation program to, to accomplish these things. We are seeing uh, increases in the program. It was increased to 12 million in uh, FY12 uh, before the uh, redirect mission was even announced. And uh, we are looking at um, another doubling of funding for the NEO program. Uh, because it's uh, it's a first step uh, in this uh, redirect mission endeavor, and that is to identify uh, the asteroid that uh, we are going to uh, collect and uh, and bring back uh, to the lunar orbit. That's been tasked to the existing uh, near Earth object observation program, which I and uh, a few other dedicated individuals uh, around the country uh, operate. Uh, but uh, it's already uh, an international effort uh, to identify and find uh, the asteroids uh, that are, are hazardous to the Earth. It's been a subject uh, from the Committee of Peaceful Uses of Outer Space of the UN uh, Office of Outer Space Affairs uh, for a number of years now. I've participated in an NEO working group uh, with that committee and uh, to uh, work the process uh, by which uh, the member states would work together to both identify a hazardous threat to the Earth and then figure out uh, what we would do about it. Um, 
the committee uh, and how the uh, uh, the UN operates has been somewhat misunderstood. The Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space provides a forum for the member states to get together to talk about how do we cooperate, collaborate, and uh, explore uh, and make uh, use of, of space uh, uh, for the betterment of, of mankind. Uh, so it's, it's the ideal forum for uh, the space-capable uh, nations to get together and talk about how would we would deal with a impact uh, threat uh, from space. And the, uh, uh, in this working group, we've uh, 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 brought to uh, the committee, and now it's been brought on up to the General Counsel uh, for approval of our recommendations. Uh, of how the uh, member states should work together. An international asteroid warning network would be set up, which is an enhancement of, of our existing network, which we've been running for some 15 years now. And a forum for the space agencies to get together and talk about mitigation uh, or deflection uh, capabilities uh, to uh, divert uh, a hazardous asteroid off a, an Earth impact would be the Space Missions Planning and Advisory Group over on the on the lower right there. Uh, we would um, uh, get to, uh, have this forum on a regular basis before a threat was ever identified so that we could talk about what capabilities we would bring to bear uh, to deal with that threat once it was um, uh, discovered. Uh, and, and once a credible threat is uh, found, then the member states would get together to uh, uh, bring the plan together that would then be taken into the international forum uh, informed with the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space who might set up an ad hoc mitigation planning advisory group to work within the international forum uh, to keep everybody uh, uh, informed and working together and advise any of the nations that might be affected by such an impact, which uh, could be a large number, it wouldn't necessarily be any one nation about what the space-capable uh, member states are doing uh, to uh, avert uh, that threat. And, and so that is uh, what has been going on in the UN uh, 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 forums under the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Uh, there's no approval of a mission or authorization of a mission by the United Nations. It is work that is done by the space-capable member states uh, with uh, the sanction of that process uh, uh, and how it uh, works together by the International uh, uh, Forum and the Committee. So back to, um, oops, did I go the wrong direction? Uh, let's go back here. Yeah, I have it the wrong direction. Okay, so back to uh, the existing uh, program that, uh, that the United States has participated in uh, and actually been the leading force uh, for uh, 15 years now. Uh, it started back in 1998 uh, with the uh, uh, NASA committee to the House Committee on Science uh, that we would find uh, uh, at least 50% of the uh, large uh, near-Earth objects those uh, one kilometer and larger in size, if the Earth were to get hit by one of those, it would be a three segment of bad day for all of us. Um, uh, and originally the uh, program averaged about four million dollars uh, a year uh, through most of the last decade. Uh, but we reached that goal of finding uh, over 90 percent of the one kilometer and larger near-Earth objects uh, in um, uh, 2010. Uh, however, uh, in the meantime, uh, as we studied uh, what size object could still do significant damage to the Earth's surface uh, in uh, two or three studies that we did uh, almost uh, a decade ago now. Uh, we found that we really got to find them to a smaller size than that uh, to sig significantly reduce the risk uh, of uh, casualties uh, in an unwarned impact uh, down to at least the 100 meter size uh, because uh, even a 100 meter size object uh, could wipe out uh, a, a large uh, region, uh, certainly larger than a city, if it uh, were to hit the earth in the wrong place. Um, so uh, the goalposts were moved uh, in 2005 uh, uh, for us to find a 100 meter class. Uh, this is the language out of the Authorization Act, uh, 140 meters in, in uh, size in order to uh, uh, have a complete assessment of the, rest of the risk of near earth objects uh, to the earth. 
And the goal of the survey would be to find 90% of those objects down to uh, 100 meter class within 15 years. Since this act was released in uh, 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 2005, that would be by 2020. Um, uh, we've got a ways to go uh, to be able to achieve that goal. Uh, so, our, But our current program is objective is to do that uh, as soon as possible. Uh, probably won't be able to achieve it by 2020 at the current at the current rate and the current capabilities. But now, starting in, uh, in last year and uh, this year, uh, the program is working with $20 million a year. And But this program also detects even smaller uh, size objects down to the size that we were talking about uh, here, a 7 to 10 meter size object or even smaller. We have actually found uh, 1 or 2 meter objects uh, as they pass uh, through the Earth-Moon system. Uh, so we're able to detect those small objects uh, as they approach the Earth, and those are exactly the type of objects that we are looking for for this asteroid redirect mission. There are objects uh, that are asteroids that are in orbits that are very uh, near Earth's orbit, uh, so that's what makes them easy to bring back. So it, it all kind of works together. Current observation program. Um, first of all, uh, we have two main uh, 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 data uh, analysis and processing center. The first one is the Minor Planet Center. The Minor Planet Center has been in operation for decades. Uh, it is the International Astronomical Union sanctioned uh, core uh, center uh, for obtaining observations uh, from observatories around the world on all the small bodies in the, in the solar system. Uh, so uh, it's been in existence for decades, and uh, it uh, is an integral part of NASA's NEO program now in that it does special processing on objects uh, that are found to be in these uh, uh, orbits near the Earth's orbit and gives us the initial orbit determination and alerts our systems when there's an object uh, of interest to us, one that could uh, be a potential hazard uh, to impact in the Earth. Uh, that information is then relayed to the NEO program office out at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, who helps uh, NASA headquarters, first of all, with the program coordination. Uh, they do the precision orbit determination um, uh, with all the observations that do come in. And then this is a group uh, of uh, orbital analysts, uh, uh, astrodynamicists, uh, that uh, uh, do uh, the navigation for spacecraft that we have uh, throughout the solar system. They put the Cassini spacecraft uh, through the rings of Saturn, uh, for goodness sake. So uh, I think they kind of know what they're doing in that, in that work. Uh, uh, so they do uh, the uh, precise orbit determination, project forward uh, where these asteroids that we've discovered are going to be in the future with the observations that are obtained. Um, and uh, uh, determine if there's any probability of impact uh, for that object, uh, not only the Earth, by the way, but all of the other uh, uh, planets and large moons in the solar system. Uh, they uh, uh, can uh, uh, predict whether an object is going to be an impact uh, uh, hazard to, the, to Mars, uh, which would be a very interesting planetary experiment to, uh, to, to see. Um, uh, so uh, those are our main processing nodes. Uh, then we have uh, currently, these are the ground-based telescopes uh, along the bottom here uh, that do the major uh, contributions uh, to search and detection and tracking uh, of uh, near-Earth asteroids. Linear uh, has been with us uh, since the beginning of the program in 98. Catalina Sky Survey had been, is our most productive uh, program. Uh, came along uh, about a, uh, 10 years ago uh, and bringing up the capability and finds almost 60% uh, of the uh, near-Earth asteroids uh, these days. PanSTARS, the University of Hawaii, is, has been coming online with a 1.8-meter uh, uh, telescope uh, and is uh, coming up on the, on the step. Uh, and uh, once uh, we are able to go to a larger percentage of, of, the, of their uh, time on the sky, for asteroid search, they will be the most um, uh, capable uh, system. And then we've had the uh, 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 one space-based uh, capability that we've been uh, uh, making use of. It was actually uh, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer uh, was to do a science mission of, of the astrophysics science mission of mapping the infrared background of the, of the sky. 
uh, to uh, great detail in preparation for the James Webb uh, uh, Space Telescope. Uh, so it does that by uh, uh, continuously imaging the sky and taking multiple images, uh, up to uh, about 15 images uh, over the course uh, of, of a day uh, of the same area of the sky. Uh, and then uh, over the course of a year, um, it will image uh, the entire sky twice. Well, we quickly realized that, uh, that this uh, instrument, uh, even though it uh, does it uh, slowly uh, than uh, a more capable uh, survey telescope would, uh, uh, is a very good uh, asteroid detector because you can take the, all those images that it collects, uh, hundreds of thousands of images of the sky, and compare them one to the other and see what moves. And the things that moves are, are, are usually asteroids. Uh, so as it uh, was in its main uh, prime mission in, in 2010, uh, started operations in 2010, uh, we uh, um, enhanced its ground processing capability to make an asteroid hunter out of it. And over the course uh, of that year, uh, 129 uh, near-Earth asteroids were found by this system. Uh, independently, and it also took observations of several thousand uh, already known um, asteroids, both near-Earth asteroids and in the main belt. So it's become one of the biggest databases there is right now uh, on asteroids in the solar system. Uh, it uh, ended its prime mission um, at the end of 2010. We ran it for a few more months. Uh, uh, for, as an asteroid hunter, but then it was put into hibernation uh, uh, f in the hopes of, of future use. Uh, with the grand challenge uh, coming on board uh, and our need uh, to make the most use of any capability we could to find asteroids, uh, we reactivated uh, WISE in a, as a dedicated asteroid hunter. Uh, it uh, was uh, woken up and uh, 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 put back into its uh, uh, stable attitude uh, back in September, and now its optics are, are cooling down uh, for it to begin imaging here within the next uh, within the next month. And we'll operate this spacecraft for as long as it uh, uh, will last, uh, and um, be in a in the right kind of an orbit uh, for about three years. We hope uh, we'll be able to operate it. Uh, currently, our sky coverage uh, with those systems that, uh, that we talk about uh, over the course of a month looks like, looks like this. Uh, we uh, can't, uh, um, from, from the ground, we can't really uh, search for these very dim objects in the full of the moon, so we lose about uh, a week or so of time every month. Um, but it takes about a month for the current system, uh, for the current systems to uh, cover most of the accessible sky. Now you'll see uh, here that um, uh, we're well covered in the nor northern uh, uh, latitudes hemisphere. Uh, we lack uh, search capability in the south, which would, uh, would be nice to have uh, a more capable search uh, capability in the south. So, uh, but these are, these are how these systems operate. They basically tile the sky, you know, starting uh, one section of the sky, uh, image it for about uh, for a few seconds, and then move on to the next tile and across the sky. And then they will come back 30 minutes to an hour later, image that same uh, part of the sky, uh, bring all that uh, data into their computer processing and compare one image to another to, to see what moves. So this is uh, uh, the actual discovery uh, imagery uh, of, of an asteroid. And uh, uh, you can see it move from one image to another. Uh, there's about 30 minutes or so uh, between those, uh, those images. And uh, we look for what moves across the sky. And uh, did you see it? Uh, this is a discovery imagery of uh, asteroid uh, 2013 MZ5, which was the 100th uh, near-Earth object uh, that uh, we have found uh, in the course uh, of our program. Uh, it was found by uh, PanStars uh, back in uh, uh, June of, of this year. And you see it. Uh, from uh, each uh, 30, 30 minute sequences move, it across, move across. Current observing network is worldwide. Um, uh, this shows uh, observatories from around the world that contributed observations uh, to our network 
um, in, in 2012. Some uh, observatories from some 46 countries, um, some of them uh, quite professional observatories. Uh, a lot of uh, observations once we found an object for follow-up tracking actually come in from amateurs, very capable amateurs for certainly the larger asteroids. When we get down to 100 meters or so in size, it's, it's, uh, it's really beyond the uh, capabilities of, of uh, even a uh, sophisticated amateur. But we've got some semi-pros out there, too, that uh, uh, even though they may not get paid for it, uh, they have very capable equipment and uh, a very dedicated uh, uh, hobby uh, for some of these. And uh, uh, some of them uh, make significant finds, like, for instance, uh, Comet Ison, which we're hearing all about right now. It's, uh, if it survives a perihelion passage uh, by the sun here in a week, uh, should be a quite spectacular object uh, in our skies in, in, in December and uh, January. That was found by a team hunting for asteroids and comets uh, uh, in Russia. Um, and um, uh, so they, uh, they make uh, significant contributions to, to the effort uh, still. Currently, uh, uh, this is our uh, population uh, uh, curve, accumulation curve from when the program started uh, in 1998 uh, through uh, this month. Uh, right now we have 10,450 near-Earth objects uh, in our catalog. That includes uh, 94 comets, by the way, and that's why we call them objects versus asteroids, because some of them are comets. Uh, and uh, 864 of those are uh, uh, larger than a kilometer in size, uh, but you see that the discovery curve has tapered off. Uh, so that means we have, have found the larger part of the population of large objects. Our completion uh, uh, percentages uh, based upon our population models, 96% of those a kilometer and larger, 60% uh, uh, in this bin, but as we get down to 100 meters and, and smaller, we have a significant uh, 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 number of objects to find and really need uh, more enhanced capability to be able to do that. Uh, our understanding of the population is based upon the modeling that's been done based on what's been found uh, versus uh, 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 the time it's been found and, and the volume of sky that it's been found in. You can do statistical models on what the po overall population is. Um, this uh, graph is a, uh, the, this is a graph for the program that has everything on it. Uh, down along the bottom here is uh, uh, absolute magnitude, the brightness of the detected object, uh, roughly compared to its size, uh, assuming uh, average reflectivity. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere uh, would protect us from any objects uh, uh, below about 30 meters in size, although Chelyabinsk, uh, uh, um, which uh, would have been here on the curve, uh, you know, uh, caused us to uh, learn a few things about what we maybe need to worry about about smaller objects. Uh, Tunguska back in 1908, which is the most significant event prior to that, uh, was about a, about a 50 meters. The KT impactor, uh, this is the one that killed the dinosaurs back 65 million years ago, and thankfully we only get an impact like that every 100 million years. Uh, so uh, one kilometer size objects, as we said, we have about a thousand of them uh, uh, to find, uh, and uh, we're well up on that curve. If we go down to 100 meter class, there's some 20,000 objects out there to be found, uh, 50 meters, uh, 250,000. If we get down, though, to the size that we're talking about here, uh, 7 to 10 meters in size, uh, we're talking about uh, millions of objects out there uh, that could be classified as near-Earth objects. Uh, but those that would really be acceptable uh, uh, for such a retrieval mission are in the right kind of near-Earth objects, or maybe on the order of, of a few thousand. Uh, we have found uh, 370 so far that fit in that size range, however not in the orbit that could be retrievable uh, by the system. There's only about 14 objects that we know of uh, right now that are in that type of orbit, and we are uh, campaign is attempting to find more more data on them. Uh, enhancements that we're doing uh, to uh, build up our capability. Uh, we're working with the Department of Defense and, uh, and and DARPA and their new space surveillance telescope, so that it has uh, NEO detection capability, so they can do that as a secondary mission. 
uh, enhancing uh, the capabilities of PanStars, uh, PanStars 1, uh, getting more time on the system uh, so that it uh, is able to de dedicate more uh, of its telescope time to search, and also uh, uh, helping the University of Hawaii complete the second PanStar system so we have a second aperture uh, that, can, that can be used. Also, we have a new uh, capability uh, that's in development uh, called uh, ATLAS. Uh, it is making use of smaller aperture telescopes, but uh, using very sophisticated uh, cameras and uh, software processing uh, to more rapidly cover the night sky so that it would be able to, uh, with a couple of these systems, be able to cover the entire night sky, uh, each, uh, not the entire sky each night. It won't go as deep uh, in other words, to see dim, uh, uh, large objects far away that are very dim, but we'd find any object that was close to Earth uh, down to uh, this size of 10 meters or so. Uh, that'll come online in 2015. Uh, with these enhanced capabilities, we expect the discovery rate uh, of ARM candidates uh, to be increased. We find about two a year now that, that meet uh, the criteria uh, that uh, is needed uh, for this retrieval mission. We think the capability with these enhancements, uh, our, stu our studies show the capability would, will be increased to at least five per year. So over the three or four years we have until uh, uh, the, the uh, launch of such a system, uh, we should be able to find at least 15 more uh, acceptable candidates uh, for the mission. Um, Another important aspect, is, as Brian went into, is being able to characterize uh, these near-Earth objects. Uh, and the, uh, we used a number of techniques, so uh, whatever is able to observe the objects to do that. Radar is an important capability, but we also use a lot of optical techniques uh, 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 to understand more about the size and mass uh, of these objects. Uh, if uh, there can be a significant difference in the size uh, that you don't know until we do this more enhanced characterization. It could be a very large dark object uh, uh, and so be outside of the capabilities uh, of the retrieval uh, spacecraft or it might be a very small but bright object and so it, it would meet the size uh, uh, that the arm could retrieve. So final uh, selection of the target will depend largely upon uh, our ability to characterize it and uh, the upper bound uh, may be, uh, uh, we, we have to work with what the upper bounds might be uh, to be within the capability uh, of the retrieval mission. Radar, as I said, is, is one of our most important capabilities to do this. Uh, and we should be able uh, to uh, now rapidly get the radar on these objects as they are discovered. In the past, a small object, we really didn't care about it. Uh, we let it go by. Uh, but now that we are interested in, in seeing these things uh, uh, for the retrieval mission, uh, we will bring those radars on as rapidly as we can after the object is discovered. We have to discover the object optically. You can't do it with radar. Uh, you don't, just don't get the signal of noise return. But once it's discovered optically, then the radar, the two uh, planetary radars can be brought up on it to uh, more fully characterize it. And that would be the best way to be able to characterize those things. Uh, so our characterization enhancements, uh, first of all, the radar, getting as much time on those as we can, and also streamlining the rapid response uh, to get uh, uh, observations on an object uh, as, as soon as it's discovered. Also in increasing our capabilities with the NASA's infrared telescope facility, uh, Mauna Kea and Hawaii, both in rapid response is, is the same with the radars, but also improving the instrumentation that's available for characterization. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we've already reactivated WISE. As I said, WISE uh, is important as a, as a discovery tool, but it's also very important in, in, in that for characterization in that it operates in the IR bands. And with uh, two IR bands, you can get a more uh, um, precise uh, determination of its size, estimate of its size, than you can, uh, than you can optically. Um, bound it within about 20% versus maybe 200% uh, with just optical uh, uh, observations. Uh, so uh, these capabilities uh, will uh, add to our capability to find not only uh, uh, a target uh, for the ARM mission, but also improve our capability to find the hazardous asteroids, which is what we've been in the business for for a long time and will continue to do. Um, 
ra rapid response after discovery of the object is, is, is key. And so these objects that we find now that we're undertaking this mission, these objects that we find in the future, uh, we'll have better characterization of those objects uh, than we did uh, previous to this time uh, because we just weren't uh, focused on the small objects because we, they're not seen as a hazard to the Earth. Um, we'll bring uh, uh, all the uh, assets that we can to bear on this uh, 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 mission in, in the next two or three years and uh, work with both interagency and international entities uh, on this capability. And so uh, with this increase in NEOs, uh, both uh, as a hazard to impact to the Earth and the opportunity that they pose uh, for not only exploration but potentially future resource utilization, this is a big uh, mission area now for, for our planetary sciences, uh, uh, not only for NASA, but uh, uh, around the world and in, in, uh, in the planetary science community. Thank you. Thank you, Lindley. Our final presenter tonight is Chris Moore. Chris Moore is the Dep Deputy Director of the Advanced Exploration Systems in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters. Chris led the RFI selection process, and he's going to give us a brief overview of that. Good evening. Uh, as Wendy said, um, I'm going to talk about the RFI process and explain why we're all here. So when we first started this asteroid initiative, we realized we'd never done anything quite like this before. So we knew that we had to get the best and most innovative ideas to help us uh, plan the missions and the flight systems development. We also realized that defending our planet against the threat of asteroid collisions really involves everybody on the planet. Everybody's got a stake in it. So we wanted to involve as many people as possible. So we cast the net widely for ideas. We released an RFI in June, and we requested information in six main areas. And the RFI was open to everyone, uh, individuals, companies, universities, other government agencies, international partners. Uh, we did receive 402 responses and we went through a process of evaluation to select the most promising and interesting proposals to discuss here at the workshop. Here's a breakdown of the responses by type of organization and we had about 40% from the general public which was really gratifying. Um, we had people who would sit down in front of their computer in the evening and type a few lines uh, describing the idea that they had. And so we really uh, captured the interest of the general public. The other large segment was from small businesses who are interested in um, stimulating new uh, markets and asteroid resources and new technologies. And we had about 10% from larger corporations, uh, the rest from NASA centers and uh, some um, observatories and universities. And here's a breakdown by the uh, six areas and um, the workshop is structured around these areas which were in the RFI. But the um, area with the most uh, responses was the asteroid uh, deflection demonstrations, followed um, closely by asteroid observation. And the one with the fewest responses was the uh, crude systems. We also got responses from all over the world, uh, from 16 uh, different countries. There was a lot of interest in Europe and from the UK, uh, but we got uh, responses from as far away as Uganda and, and uh, Finland, so it was really uh, great to see that. We 
touch people around the world. These are the criteria we use to decide uh, which ideas would be presented here at the workshop. Uh, we had a team of NASA reviewers who read all the proposals and we tried to assess them uh, relative to these four factors. Uh, the first factor was how relevant was it to the objectives of the RFI? Did it address one of the six main areas and did it uh, demonstrate a clear understanding of these areas? The second factor was how much impact would the idea have on ensuring mission success or accelerating asteroid observations? Uh, reducing risk or improving performance of the system. Was it a really innovative idea and most um, importantly was it feasible? Was it something that we could incorporate into our plans? The third factor was maturity. Um, some of the ideas we got were really great ideas but they were way out ideas that re require a lot of development so we had to decide if uh, it was feasible that these new uh, technologies could ma be matured in a reasonable time frame to uh, incorporate into our mission plans. And the fourth factor was affordability. Uh, can the concept um, significantly improve the uh, affordability? And uh, we also tried to involve as many people that we hadn't talked to before. Um, we didn't want to talk to the usual suspects because we know what's going on in the NEO observation program. and So we wanted to get ideas from outside the usual sphere. So that's how we arrived at the 96 um, briefings that you'll hear. And the abstracts of all of these responses are archived on the web, so you can download them if you're interested. So what do we want to get out of this workshop? Uh, we've asked the leads for each of the groups uh, to summarize the most promising ideas and describe any uh, technology development that may be needed to mature these ideas to the point where they can be incorporated into designs. Are there any relationships or linkages that could help with system or mission integration. And we really don't want this to be just a bunch of presentations. Uh, we want to encourage discussion. That's why we're here. And we'd like you to come up with findings and recommendations on how to use all these great ideas. So we have a, a wealth of data and we're just trying to synthesize all these um, ideas into products that we can actually use in planning our next steps. So I think that we can reflect on the importance of this um, asteroid initiative in history. Uh, if we're successful with the redirect mission, uh, for the first time we'll be rearranging the solar system to bring humanity greater prosperity and security. Uh, greater prosperity by using asteroid resources, uh, greater security by protecting our planet from the threat of asteroid collisions. And this is pretty incredible if you really stop and think about it. The solar system's been in existence about four and a half billion years and the planets and the asteroids and the comets have been circling the sun all that time, moving under the influence of gravity, but not really perturbed by anything that happens on Earth. And now we're a spacefaring species and we have the capability to shape the solar system for our own purposes. So we tend to get excited about all the science and the engineering and the technology that goes into this mission, but let's also reflect on how it conveys the human spirit.
to explore. So all of you are helping us take the first steps in this great endeavor um, by being here and telling us about your ideas. Um, we do appreciate and value your inputs and the time you've devoted to this workshop. So we look forward to a lot of uh, great discussions and uh, we're really excited to see this program get started. So uh, that's the last uh, presentation for this evening. We're going to open it up for questions now and I'll turn it back to, to Wendy. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thanks to all our presenters this evening. We're um, running short on time, so um, we probably only have time for one or two, if there's anyone. Hi. I had a question for um, Lindley Johnson, I guess. Are there any plans to actually extend assets in deep into the southern hemisphere, uh, Chile or South Africa or, some, or even, for that matter, the South Pole? I mean, it seems like it's a missing gap to the program? Well, um, over the course of time, it, it's not so important uh, that we're not searching from um, uh, the Southern Hemisphere uh, because uh, we hope to discover these objects you know, uh, many years before they might be an impactor. But uh, that aside, it would be good for uh, some of the Southern Hemisphere countries to, to join uh, the effort and uh, you know, add capability both for search and tracking uh, of, uh, of newly discovered objects. We have one over there. What happens uh, after the workshop? What happens to the material? How does it get fed into uh, headquarters planning and so forth? for uh, actual mission? So there's actually two routes that are currently um, planned, no pun intended. The first is the leads for the study efforts that were discussed are present and here, have been asked to listen and incorporate any of their, uh, any of the highly uh, rated ideas in the synthesis Friday afternoon into their studies. The second is that the robotic concept integration team that has been chartered and is being led by Jim Ryder at Marshall has been asked to <coughs> perform a figures of merit assessment, including ideas that come out of this workshop, uh, so that we're ensuring that we've got a um, quantitative analysis of uh, an integrated system and a mission concept that brings, brings the best and brightest forward. I would also say that um, the robotic concept integration team has been asked to make recommendations on any future activities that we might um, offer as a follow-on to this RFI to gain more analysis in specific areas that fit into the results of the FOM analysis. I'm not sure if that's clear enough, but in our industry day, we will announce any changes in our plans as a result of the robotic concept integration team, as well as the internal studies that continue to evolve. Thank you. Um, and I also believe that we have a question online. So there's been lots of discussion online and a few questions on Twitter about mission schedule and cost. Michelle, could you summarize that asteroid redirect mission timeline and briefly address the cost? Is it possible to bring my slides back up? There's a slide um, four, which just re-articulates the alignment strategy that's been discussed uh, since Robert Lightfoot, our associate administrator, first <coughs> discussed this mission concept. Sorry. Slide four, please. So this chart actually if you watch the versions as we continue with our concept development it evolves over time you can see the um, addition of the NeoWise activation in this version as well as the uh, anticipated 
um, enabling of a robotic mission launch in 2018, which includes a solar electric propulsion demo, and uh, the crewed EM-1 mission of SLS and Orion. So the basic strategy is to um, leverage ongoing activities inside the organization, inside NASA, with um, key strategic investments in other areas to enable this strategy to occur. So I would say that our current studies are looking at technical and programmatic feasibility. These timelines will change as we gain more data, including on targets like Lindley Johnson suggested or presented um, his observation asset plans that are being put in place. And as this timeline um, matures and we gain a better understanding of um, technical and programmatic feasibility combined, um, we'll, have, we'll have better answers to that question. Thanks again, Michelle. Okay, so we're out of time, but um, there have been some great conversations going online, and we want to try to keep that going. So we want to remind everyone that um, the hashtag NASA Asteroid and that we will have chat rooms and hashtags for each session. And so um, keep the conversation going. And this concludes our plenary session. And we look forward to having everyone back tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. for the session topics. Thank you.